a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Our special focus today is on how we might think of addressing what for many churches is a difficult challenge, reaching new, younger generations. Not every church has the capacity to employ a youth minister. But every church needs a plan for resourcing, supporting and growing the number of young children, young people involved as active disciples in church. So how do you fix the issues around youth ministry and prepare the soil for a new generation? Well, our special guest today, the Reverend Dr. Graham Stanton, is a lecturer in practical theology and director of the Ridley Centre for Children's and Youth Ministry in Melbourne. He's one of the keynote speakers at the upcoming Amplify Conference on the 2nd of March. That's a Saturday, just Saturday the 2nd of March. Time's closing in, isn't it? But you'll be able to join in that conference Uh, not only at a number of hubs that are all over the nation, from Cairns in Queensland to Warrnambool in Victoria and Adelaide in South Australia, you'll also be able to join in an online hub as well, and I'll tell you about how you can do that. But Graham's latest research explored how young Australians experience and understand God and the stories of how those beliefs have been formed. So it's going to be a conversation today As I say, one to listen in a little closely to, but the Reverend Dr. Graham Stanton. Graham, a special welcome along to 2020. Uh, Neil, thanks so much. Uh, And Graham is fine. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Hey, Graham, um, the Amplify Conference, um, Mm. you are one of the keynote speakers. Um, Give us a thought or two here on the theme, which is about reconnecting. This is something that uh, if you're going to talk about reconnecting, you're obviously thinking about how a disconnection might have happened. Uh, Give us a thought or two about what this theme is. Yeah, it's been one of the challenges of the church, really, that uh, the statistics are not good. You know, um, uh, one one study would say that of the 11-year-olds that are part of our churches. Uh, now, by the time they turn 20, 72% of them will no longer attend church regularly. Uh, that, that's a real problem, you know. Um, will, or young people, and then they wander away and they're young adults. No, they don't. They, they, are, they are disconnecting from the church. And so uh, a lot of churches are, are beginning to realise, hang on, we, we don't have young people present with us. So how do we reconnect? How do we re- re-engage? Uh, it's sort of a question, sort of a bit born of desperation, right? You know, like literally we're becoming this dying institution, but actually the reconnection or just the simple connection with children and young people, it, it's part of it's part of our privilege and uh, joy that, that we get to do this, to hand on the, the wonderful things of God to the next generation. So... That's what Amplify is all about. I want to embrace everyone listening into our conversation today because some might be thinking, well, uh, the children's and youth ministry in church, well, the pastor or the priest at my church, well, they look after that and there's someone who's designated as the children's leader or the youth leader and and they work that out. Mm. How do we embrace everyone in church life to recognize Mm. this generational need for reconnection? Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a writer from the UK called Tim Goff, and uh, he he says the magic word in children's and youth ministry is something. We just want to employ someone to do something with the young people, and it doesn't really matter what that something is. It's sort of just so we don't have to worry about it anymore. You know. Okay. If um, if we were to if you were to ask me the question, uh, you know, can I introduce you to my family? What what if I was to say to you, oh, in my family, uh, so I'm married. Uh, we've got three, I think. Three, four, maybe five children. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly, but there's one of them whose name uh, starts with J. There's another. There's a second girl. There is a boy. Um, there's another girl who hangs around a bit at our place. I'm not sure whether she's actually my child or not. <laughs> and uh, I've got a feeling that there's another one. You know, like you, you'd think, what sort of what sort of father are you? What sort of family is this? You know, I reckon we ask our church families we talk about the church family no who are the who are the young people in your church it's, oh i don't know 
I think there are some. Uh, they they come on Friday night, so I don't I don't ever ever see them. You know, well that speaks to the quality of our family life. Family is not just about adults. Family is about all of us. You know, and it's a privilege that we have, and and we seem to not. We seem to not value what children and young people can bring to the life of the whole church. We see them as a bit of a, perhaps either a a, a burden or a or, or a necessary thing, something for the long term survival of the church. But actually, here is the the blessing and the privilege of being God's people together. What you're saying is that when you turn up to church on Sunday and you see that group of young people congregating together and, uh, you know, they're dressing the same and they're talking a little bit of a different language to what you are, uh, what you're saying is uh, don't just pass them by. Yeah. Uh, there's this familiness about church which says we are concerned about our children. Um, we don't often think about those children, those young people at church as being our responsibility what you're saying is uh, to embrace everyone here and if you're going to grow generationally you've actually got to treat those young people uh, with a wonderful uh, reconnected familiness is that a way to, to think of it i mean not everybody understands family i think perhaps the way that uh, that you might be talking but or i might be talking but but there's this yeah. somehow or other you've got to break uh, the the tough exterior and and actually converse with these young people yeah, yeah. And there, there are a couple of ways of thinking about family and, and how young people are part of the family. So one would come, say, from Mark chapter 10. Uh, Jesus talks about those who have uh, lost um, you know, mothers, brothers, um, you know, fields for the sake of the gospel. And he says that they will not fail to receive a hundred times over in this age, mothers, brothers, fields. And with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. How do you how do you gain a hundred mothers if you've lost relationship with your own mother for the sake of Christ? Well, the answer is you become a member of the church, and you come to church, and there are a whole bunch of older women who become mother figures for you. And so, when we talk about family ministry, sometimes that can be really exclusive because we're thinking, oh, family ministry. That's you know, intact families, mum, dad, and the kids, and it excludes so many other people who are part of our community, people who are, who are never married, people who are no longer married, people who are married but don't have children, and people who are children but don't have parents either alive or don't have parents who are believers. But all of us are brothers and sisters, uh, um, uncles, aunts, you know, um, uh, spiritual mothers, fathers, that's that's a blessing that we have to extend to one another. So I want us to lean into that idea. That is really important for the sense of belonging of young people. Graham, we used to talk about a generation gap, and my suspicion is if we're talking about disconnection and the need for reconnection, there's a generation gap in church. And part of that generation gap, and my suspicion is that from the younger people, uh, they don't need another authority figure, another lecture uh, coming from someone who just wants to offload their wisdom in some ways that will be like, uh, let me you know, stand still, young man. I'm going to tell you about how to do this. No. Somehow or other, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm thinking here the listening ear is going to be important. So how do you talk mm. about uh, this, you know, uh, middle and older generations reconnecting? Is there, a, mm. is there something that we can pick up as a practical key here? Mm. A simple one is in, as, as you relate to an adolescent, um, try and make sure that there's only one adolescent in the conversation, you know, <laughs> Which I don't mean, I, what I don't mean is make sure you talk to them in secret so it's just you and them, okay? No, no. What I mean is uh, we get very, I think we get very adolescent again when we're talking to a young person. We feel like we're back in high school and it's like, do they really like me? Do they not like me? Um, uh, I'm, uh, what, what are they thinking about what I'm wearing? Uh, you know, I, I'm so scared about how I'm coming across. It's like, that's what I felt like when I was 16, right? Right. Time, time to take a deep breath and think, you know, actually, I'm here for them. I'm going to be adult. 
I'll be adult in this conversation. I'm here for them, right? Um, there's a there's so much fear. I think that comes from adults where f- we're fearful of teenagers, and get over that. Like the worst thing that's going to happen is that they'll they'll you know either grunt at you, maybe laugh and walk away. Well, okay, that's not fun. But be an adult, right? And that what the research tells us is that young people actually they are looking for connection with adults. You know, mm-hmm. they're looking for connection with people who are interested in them. And uh, looking for connection with people whose experience of life brings something which is different to the the sort of you know ephemeral surface stuff that is so present for them. You know, I think that we have bought into this idea that there's this massive gap, and I think I think adults in in the church contribute to that because we back away. You know, so you can. So Bill Hybels has got his book yep. um, uh, Walk Across the Room. He's talking about evangelism, and what we need to do in evangelism is just walk all the way across the room to talk to people. And I think we've got to do that with young people. Um, so you can fix this instantly. Um, you know, uh, just add water, uh, just add a conversation. And actually, I mean, I, you know, sometimes we think of, well, we've got to talk to a reverend doctor uh, and to get some real wisdom and insight. And, uh, and oh. then you share something so profound that you could fix this instantly by saying at church on Sunday, I'm going to talk to those young people. Just yeah. walk across what? the room, uh, all the way yeah. across the room. And I don't know, do you have to push in? Uh, what do you do? Just, just stand on the attic? You can look for an opportunity? What, what sort of things do you think? Just because, you know, sometimes young people are going to be taken by surprise. You know, uh, yeah. there's Graham Stanton uh, wandering across the room. And he's talk to me today. Uh, what's he going to say? Yeah. First thing, first thing, simple thing, find out their name. And remember their name and then use their name. This is actually a research finding. Uh, when people uh, have done studies of what is it that keeps young people in the fellowship of the church, gives them that sense of belonging, one of the leading indicators when they interview people that have young people who've stayed in the church, when you ask them what is it that has built this sense of belonging for you, then one of the answers is um, when I went to church, people knew my name. So if a young person turns up at church and you are able to look them in the eye and just say, hi, Graham, nice to see you, and provided it is actually Graham who's, t- who's turned up, you know, and provided you are actually glad to see them, you know, like just that simple act, getting to know their names. Life, culture and current events from a biblical perspective. 2020 on Vision. Our talk back line open on 1-800-316-316. You might like to join into our conversation today as we talk about reconnecting with young people. Uh, you might even want to argue there's no disconnect. You might have your own story to tell about what's going on in your own church experience. Uh, are there children and young people? Because increasingly we're finding that there are going to be some churches where there are no children and young people and you're saying well how do we get a start how do we re-fire up things others are saying well we've got a great vibrant uh, children's ministry an incredibly good youth ministry and sometimes we're going to think about the youth minister the youth pastors the role that they play there Our special guest this hour is the Reverend Dr. Graham Stanton. He's one of the keynote speakers at the upcoming Amplify Conference. Graham, let's talk about youth leaders in church. And as I just mentioned, you know, some just haven't got kids and they haven't got any youth in their church. And they're the ones I'm sure that, you know, ought to have some real concern around there. But others do have a vibrant ministry. Um, What do we think about youth leaders? Well, firstly, is that uh, anyone can be a youth leader. Or rather, to qu- I'm, now, I'm now quoting the uh, the film Ratatouille. I discover um, a youth a youth leader can come from anywhere. Often we we've got this picture. What is a youth leader? It's like a 22 year old uh, gregarious uh, young person who uh, you know has probably got tattoos and um, speaks some youth jargon. And that stereotype is, I think, really unhelpful. Like any. Anybody can be a youth leader. A youth leader is somebody who loves Jesus and who loves young people and has got the boldness to come alongside a young person and say, 
could I help you follow Jesus the way that I follow Jesus? And as we talk, I, I would love to learn how to follow Jesus as you're learning how to follow Jesus. Is there That's a sense do, you know? in which sometimes you think of youth leadership or being the youth pastor is that's the stepping stone that I go through uh, to be a grown-up pastor. Uh, mm. and, and is that a wrong assumption? Uh, are there people who ought to be career youth leaders? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, how many of us have gone up to the, um, the, the high school teacher at church? So you, you're a really good high school teacher. You know, I reckon you should you should actually do proper teaching and go teach at a university. That that'd be good. You know, you're so good at this high school thing. Um, I reckon I reckon you could really be useful as a teacher. And I think, hang on, I am a teacher. I teach teenagers. That's my thing. I do this for the rest of my life. And then we come to church and we think, oh, you know, once you get once you get over 23, you can't be a youth leader because you know young people don't like older people. No, I, I just think it's it's it sells young people short, and it and it, it just just ignores the the wisdom that they need, and it, and it just has this vision of what youth ministry is about is just somebody who has got energy running around with them. No, what young people need are adults who will come alongside them, that we might accompany them in a spiritual journey, their journey and our journey that we would share together. Yeah. Is there a professionalization of youth ministry? <clears throat> because, uh, you know, you have young people going through Bible colleges and they're graduating at the other side and, uh, and there's an expectation that they might move into a paid position, a career mm. role, and they're going to look around for uh, a great church that's got extra dollars mm. and they can afford them. Uh, what I can hear in your heartbeat here is that um, the, the paid youth leader isn't necessarily the answer. Uh, uh, yeah, look, I would say that um, the yeah the paid youth leader isn't the necessary answer. That the large youth group is not necessarily the only way to do things. I, I do want to say that where churches have the resources, and 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 where churches could could you know draw on the resources to have somebody who has developed that expertise because they have a. a a sense of vocation from God. This is a call that I want to dedicate my life to to advocating ministry to and with and by young people. I really think that is a ministry in the church that we have underplayed because we've, we've thought that we just get somebody who can do something with the young people. So if there's a 20, 22, 23-year-old who has got the energy to, to run around, play dodgeball, do some gross food games and pray every now and then, then that's okay. No, that that's not good enough. Who, who among us would uh, look around the local area and find a high school where all of the teachers were under 25 and very few of the teachers had any formal t teacher training and they, they uh, turned over every two or three years? None of us would, would entrust our children to that. And what I can hear you saying too here is that every church has the seeds of a youth ministry. Yeah. No matter how old, uh, those who are in your church, they might be middle-aged years, but they might be parents. So it's not as yeah. though they've got inexperience when it comes to children mm. and young people. And then mm. you get the older ones, uh, well, they might have grandchildren. So they're yeah. not inexperienced with children and young people either. So every yeah. church has the seeds of youth ministry. It's just a matter of revealing and uh, and uncovering and identifying those. Yeah, yeah. And I would ask people and ask your listeners, you know, if you, if you really like young people, uh, you just... Uh, you love talking with them. You you uh, you like their 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 passions and the things that they're interested in. You find them you find them interesting and intriguing. You find the things that they struggle with heartbreaking. You have a you have a real love for them. It doesn't matter what age you are, then you bring that loving concern and interest in the name of Jesus with a young person, and, and such a blessing is available there. Graham, some might be thinking, I used to have that passion. I used to have mm. an ability to be able to relate to young people. But somehow or other, this disconnection happened. 
Can you revitalise that connection? Is it just a matter of getting around those young people and having those conversations you were talking about earlier? Yeah, to, to sit down with a young person and say, hi, look, my, my name's Graham. I'm really sorry. I've seen you at, at, at our church for, for months, even years. I, I don't know your name. Could you tell me what your name is? And they might say, yep, my name's, my name's Fred. I think, Fred, I'm pleased to meet you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to endeavour to remember your name for next week. And then next week you say, is it Fred? <laughs> Fred, hello, <laughs> welcome. I'm really glad to see you. And then, and and you build you build a relationship. And ask Fred, you know, Fred, tell me, um, and and even a point of vulnerability. You know, I feel like I, I knew how to engage with the young people 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years ago. Now now I feel a little bit a little bit anxious. Um, but I'd love to hear about you. Can you tell me about you? Young people love talking about themselves. All of us love talking about ourselves. Yeah. And, and no, doubt, little- no doubt hearing their story is going to be the thing that will break the ice and the relationship will open before right. you tell your story. But eventually, yeah. potentially, there's that opportunity, isn't there, to tell your story. I'm, not, I'm going to ask you about stories after the news. Graham, let me ask you about uh, something perhaps you know, a little bit of a practical example. Um, you mentioned that there are some grandparents who actually get very creative with the ways that they are involving themselves in their grandchildren's lives. How might this relate to ordinary people in ordinary church, in ordinary communities all around Australia? Yeah, yeah. This story comes from a friend of mine who is doing uh, youth ministry in the Anglican Church in Canada, so working with a lot of congregations that were small and elderly, and they would look at her and say, well, look, I know that you're in a youth ministry. We don't have any young people, so look, bless your work. Find another church that has some young people. And uh, and she would ask ask them, how many grandchildren do you have together? And so in a church of you know, 15, 20 uh, older people, there were, there were you know, um, uh, heaps of, I can't do the maths, Lots of people, lots of young people that sort of, she said, they could be your youth ministry. So there was a, there was one gentleman, grandfather, his, uh, his family, his grandson lived in another city in the United States. And he then decided he would arrange to have a, a video uh, conference meeting uh, with his grandson once a week. So on sort of Thursday night, they would, uh, they would both meet online on video and the grandfather would order pizza and get pizza delivered to his own house and pizza delivered to his grandson's house. They would eat pizza together and then they would uh, talk. How was your week? Um, let's read a part of scripture together. Um, what do you hear in that? This is what I hear in that. How can I pray for you? This is what you could pray for me. They pray together half hour a week. There, there was what a crackingly good youth ministry. And you know what? There'll be listeners thinking, you know what? I can probably afford to get the pizza delivered to yeah. my grandchildren or to some of those young people in church if you're going to have some sort of virtual online gathering where you get to connect with those teenagers. Mm. Hey, I want to ask you about being a teenager today because mm. uh, this is a very challenging world. Uh, there are a lot of things that are confronting our nation, and lots of those impact on young people. Uh, mm. I wonder if you can put your predictions hat on as well and give us some insights into what you think might be coming ahead for young people, mm. because it's already difficult now, and is it going to get even harder? Yeah. Yeah. And look, the one, one simple thing to say is, I've got no idea. <laughs> like, we have no idea what life is going to be like for our our teenagers over the next um, you know ten years, fifteen years. the The children who are currently in your church, what is life going to be like for them at high school? And like, who knows? Um, what, which is one of the reasons why we need youth leaders who are adaptable and ready to respond to new challenges, new ideas. Uh, um, yeah, uh, new new difficulties. Okay, so that's that's one aspect of it. But the other is just to recognise everything that's sort of fringe and strange at the moment 
is just going to be normal and ubiquitous uh, for young people. And, and, and that presents significant challenges. So like, you know, at the moment, particularly in the academic world, in teaching world, we're grappling with like chat GPT, uh, generative artificial intelligence, you know, how do you, how do you teach in this sort of world and, and so on. And well, at the, I, I sort of look around at that and I think, well, I sort of don't mind that I'm, you know, I'm getting getting towards the end of my career. I'm not, I mean, I'm not about to retire, but I'm I'm 55. It's it's more like I've got, you know, 10, 15 years of teaching ahead of me. It's not like I'm, uh, you know, 15. And if you're 15, you got to this. This will be your world. You know, I can just look at this as a bit of a strange anomaly, and I can be the the strange guy who doesn't engage with this newfangled thing. But it's going to be absolutely front and center. That, that's a new world that we don't really understand. Uh, anything that's fringe now is going to be dominant um, uh, in the future. We don't exactly know what that is, but we know that there's uh, the, the sorts of um, uh, um, social splintering that we see, the moves towards isolation, um, growth in uh, um, mental illness. Um, these, are, these are trends that don't look like they're about to abate. Right. So it's it's a combination, I think, as you look to the future of some worrying, worrying trends that I think will only increase and new problems that I don't the thing we know how to anticipate. So we've got this shaping of what young people think and also what young people believe. And uh, of course, in church life and when we're delivering the gospel, when we're participants in a great commission, we're interested in what you believe, and what you believe shapes the way you, uh, the outcomes of your life. So, in some sense, here you can't avoid the opportunities that are there because you can think that there are a lot of threats around the changing AI environment and the way that young people are actually being shaped in their social media and everything is an mm. online environment, but. Somehow or other, you can't be detached from that. What do we do, Graham, with the fact that in all of that, uh, that still, I think, in church life, uh, the majority of converts to Christianity are still young people. It's children and teenagers. Uh, You've got to be able to connect the two, haven't you, with the changing environment Mm. and the fact that this is where beliefs are born and beliefs are shaped. Mm. Well, I think uh, I, I don't sort of map out a... A challenging future in a sense of let's let's be afraid it's all going to be really terrible actually the contrary to recognize that within that within a world that is splintering within a world that seems uh, more and more sort of disconnected from reality that's more and more challenging then the, the church and the christian faith offers like responses to all of these things it's it's not like we're scratching around thinking oh goodness I wonder how we respond to isolation. Well, well, we have community. We have fellowship. Uh, I wonder how we, we respond to hopelessness. Well, we have a, a gospel of, of hope, of light and love and life in Christ. There is, there is so much that, uh, that the embodied Christian community offers, both, both in ideas, um, uh, uh, practices, Ways to actually navigate and 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 people to to accompany us. So I think yes, we will probably see a an increase in this sort of disembodied type artificial world. But as that happens, we can't escape our humanity, and young people can't escape their humanity either. I think we'll see more of a hankering for the things that are well, the analog world. And what can be offered, and what can be offered in older people that have, that they've they've lived more than just the last five minutes. You know, there, there's something of history and tradition that comes out of the Christian church. We can offer that to young people. Here's an embrace. Here's a here's a place of being known, uh, unlike the artificial and and self constructed world of, of the online space. You know, and there's so much that we have to offer. Let's not be afraid of that and actually lean into it. I love the way you frame those thoughts. Uh, You can't escape humanity. And 
while there are those of us who might have held our faith for a long, long time and we appreciate what it is to have this connection with Christ, to to have our identity aligned with him, to have that meaningfulness, that purposefulness to our lives. And you remind us, Graham, yes, Mm. the young people today, they can't escape humanity and the same sorts of things are going to be confronting them. And when you describe Mm. isolation and hopelessness, uh, emptiness, and the sorts of pursuits that all of those young people are going to be trying to fill those voids in their lives, this perhaps is a connecting point here because sometimes we're not convinced that what we've got actually is real. Um, For, you know, being convinced of those things in our own lives, uh, where our identity is placed in Christ. Sometimes you've got to just adjust those things, make sure you're right, because if you're going to be delivering something into a young person's life, you know that they can't escape humanity and they're facing the same questions. Any thoughts further on that? Yeah, um, maybe this is one of the things that we're afraid of young people and afraid of youth ministry or think it's going to be too hard and think that what young people want they need, they need something bright and shiny. They need uh, something that's high energy. Uh, we've got to somehow, how do we match the attractive power of a Taylor Swift stadium show? How, how can we do that? So, well, let, let's do all we can to be as shiny and glitzy as possible. And we mistake the fact that this, this may be what young people get involved in, and there is something that they enjoy about that, but... We have something which is rich and deep that we can that we can offer that is that is needed in that sort of world, you know, um, and and that is this. Uh, it, it comes back to human beings connecting with other human beings, saying we, we've actually found this thing of great beauty and goodness and truth in the Lord Jesus, and. Uh, looking for ways that we can extend that place of knowing, that that sense of belonging, that offer of gracious love that we've received from Jesus. We're offering that to others. Let's get back to this is this is our core business. This is what the church does, right? We we connect human to human. We can do that with young people. But it comes from a place beginning with that listening. How, can I get to know your world? What's going on for you? I don't have to match your world. I can be, but I can be interested in it, and as I'm interested in it, I build this sense of belonging and acceptance and trust. Then, as you begin to share parts of your story, our vulnerabilities can connect, and in that space, there's an opportunity to offer. You know what? In 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 my moments of of need and uncertainty, this is what I hear from God, as God says this to me in the scriptures. As uh, Jesus comes uh, and offers his light and life and love, there is there is strength for me. I wonder what that would be like for you, that kind of connection. You'll have your moments of uncertainty. Uh, this is how I deal with that uncertainty and how I hear from God in those moments. Beautiful wisdom. Let's come back to youth leaders Uh, Because uh, the thought that, well, you don't have to have that young 22-year-old gregarious young uh, youth leader. You could actually Mm -hmm. have someone who's in their middle years or even in their older years because uh, they might have a passion or reconnect with that passion for young people. And they will be just as effective because they're going to be able to bridge that gap because they are wanting to reach out a hand and embrace young people. Uh, Let's talk about uh, the long-term youth leader, Uh, Mm. the person who might be thinking right now, I can do this in our church. I can identify there's a need in my church right now. Uh, How do Mm. I think about it? I mean, do we need to fund it? Uh, How does this all work, Graham? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Do we need to fund it? I think my answer is yes. Um, Where where there is is capacity, we we recognize the need. Like, so the statistics are both against us and for us. 72% of 11-year-olds will the church by the time they're 20, if the history repeats itself. And yet still 80% of, uh, of adults say that they make commitments to Jesus before the age of 20. So here's this time of opportunity, but we know it's also, it's, an, it's, it's a time of decision. People make decisions either for or against Jesus. So what are we going to do with that? Recognise also that 
to be a a Christian young person today, particularly um, going to uh, to uh, school and engaging with popular culture, it is a it's a hostile place for Christian faith. Like we get that young people are at the the forefront of cultural change, big questions that they're grappling with. So what we need is people that would be committed long-term to develop the sorts of uh, skills and ministries and uh, work out how do we best support and engage young people with these deep challenges that are, that are before them. Now, I love gregarious 22-year-olds. You know, they're some of my favourite people in the world and they are excellent they can be excellent ministers to young people, provided they love Jesus and they love young people. You know, there are a bunch of gregarious 22-year-olds that love themselves, and uh, youth ministry is a really simple place for them to, to you know, be built up and feel like a king. Okay, we don't want them, um, but you know, being gregarious in 22—that that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But lots of people uh, could do this as well, and then you think, okay. Um, Let's let's gather the people that recognise this is a thing that I want to dig into and commit to, and let's support one another. Let's get good training. Let's uh, uh, pro, uh, combine our, our collective wisdom uh, so that we might develop some grey hairs in this ministry, that uh, we stick at this long enough to get good at it, and that our communities would would recognise that and support these people that would then lead all of us in this privilege and responsibility. If you're thinking we can start to do something this weekend, uh, what would it look like, do you think, in a local church if you said, uh, if you got together with a friend or two, uh, maybe you listened to a podcast, uh, this conversation, and, uh, and it just sowed a new seed of hope, uh, what would it look like uh, to get something started and turn over a new leaf for 2024? Mm. I, I think if we made a commitment that we would pray regularly for the salvation of young people and for their uh, involvement, their, their release, their, their, to be enabled to take their place in the mission of God and the ministry of the church. Let's make that a, a constant prayer. Okay? So, Because first we need to change our hearts. We can't be, if you're going into youth ministry and thinking, okay, these are some tips and tricks so that we might collect some teenagers so that our institution won't die, then that... Young, young people will smell the, the superficiality of that invitation from a mile off. Okay? Um, it, it won't work. It doesn't honour young people. It doesn't honour Jesus. It's not, it, it doesn't receive the gift that Jesus has for us. You know? So let's pray that the heart that God has for young people would be our heart as well. Right? And then where we have the opportunity, let's just make those little connections. I'm going to know names. I, I want to... I want to find out. I'm going to ask questions, be curious, learn about them. And then, you know, if, we're, if we've got those things in place, let's think about what are, the, what are the sacrifices that we're willing to make. I made of mine a great youth minister, great youth minister, uh, a shout out to Jimmy Young um, uh, down in Cranbourne um, in the uh, sort of southeast of, uh, of Melbourne. He asked the question of older people, um, what are the sorts of sacrifices, changes that you would be willing to make so that your grandchildren would be willing and enthusiastic about sitting next to you in church? Mm. Like that's, that's what we're talking about. Yep. Often, often we think, yeah, we want some young people in the church. As long as we don't have to change anything about the church, no, that, that's never been the, the, the heart of the heart of the, of the Christian church at our best, it's it's how, how do we be the sort of community that can bring this message of Jesus with as much clarity and conviction and, and power as, as we can in a way that's really going to connect with others for the sake of others, for the glory of Jesus. It's not about my comfort. Um, so that might mean sacrifices in how we spend our money. It might be sacrifices in um, uh, the, the sort of ministry roles that we want to fund. Do I want to fund somebody who can um, um, look after my own interests as an adult 
or am I going to say, actually, what's more important is that we fund somebody who might bring some expertise in ministry among young people to minister among teenagers and to equip the rest of us to minister among young uh, teenagers as well. I know there'll be some who are thinking, uh, I can hear you talking to me, Graham, and uh, maybe I'll be the one who helps to get maybe a, a group together mm. at my local church. But I might be thinking there's somebody in my local church, they might not be listening to our conversation today, but mm. there's a person that you're thinking of in your local church saying, this is the person that does relate to those young people on Sunday. This is the person who has that capacity. But something or other is disconnected and the pastor's not thinking of that person because maybe they're you know, in their 40s and, yeah. uh, and they're not being considered to be yeah. in a role of youth ministry. What does your thoughts here, what does a full-time youth minister look like? Um, yeah. with, starting with what you've got in your local church, Building on that, what's the mm. profile? What's the character? Yeah. What's what is what's the personality? What does the full time youth minister look like? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's somebody who likes young people, right? That that's that's a start, <laughs> and it, that's a spiritual gift, right? If if somebody actually likes young people, I'd say to you, if that's you, then realize that's. <laughs> I say that's not normal. Um, <laughs> what I mean is that not everybody has that deep passion and desire to connect with young people, fascination, love for them. A love for them and a love for Jesus. But some, sometimes people think, why do we need a full-time youth minister to spend a few hours a week to prepare for two hours of youth group on Friday night? Like, that's not a full-time job. And I agree, it's not a full-time job. Youth ministry is not just about, I'm the Pied Piper that does something with the teenagers. The full-time youth minister is the church leader who is who is going to uh, minister both to but also with and by young people, promoting ministry to young people, with young people, and ministry by young people uh, for the sake of the mission of the whole church as we you know, do our work to promote and extend the kingdom of God. Um, so uh, a full-time youth ministry is somebody who is they're, they're, they're part of the church leadership. They are, they're preaching they are leading services, they're leading small groups, they're running training, and there'll be training of how do, you, how do you help parents of teenagers? How do you help grandparents of teenagers? How do you help pe people who don't have their own children or their own Christian children? How do we equip you just to be a congregation member who is creating a positive space for teenagers? Um, uh, how, how do we... Um, enable teenagers to bring their own gifts um, to the life of the church. It's it's that sort of general ministry role, but with that special focus of the life of adolescence. Graham, we've run out of time. You know, my hope is that there will be a flood of people who are hearing our conversation today somehow connecting with you and uh, with, uh, and I'm going to mention that Amplify conference uh, because it's coming up just over a week away, the 2nd of March. That's a Saturday, Saturday the 2nd of March. And there are hubs literally in towns and cities all over the country. You'll be able to find uh, where those hubs are. There might be one you can attend personally. And if you can't get to one of those personally because uh, you feel like, oh, I'm in a, such an isolated place, you'll be able to connect online because this is just an outstanding opportunity to be able to really uh, embrace some of the sorts of things we've been talking about today, but to learn about a lot of things on a whole lot of different levels and to even establish a network around where you can get wisdom and to grow that children's and youth ministry in your local church. The Amplify Conference, Saturday the 2nd of March. Now, there is a code... And if you use the word vision, uh, listeners, there is a $15 discount off the price of the standard registration. Here is the website, amplifyconference.com.au, amplifyconference.com.au. 
And Graham Stanton has been our guest through this hour. This conversation will be on a podcast a little later this afternoon. Uh, there might be someone you can send a copy of this to. You might want to listen again because it has been overflowing with the sort of wisdom that can re-fire uh, some children and youth ministry in your local church. Graham, I want to thank you so much for taking some time to share your heart with listeners today on 2020. Thanks, Neil. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.